and the hippos were boiled in their tanks. Chapter 9. Will Dennison. Wednesday night was the same story. When I got to Al's on my way home from work, there sat Rico and Philip. It seems they had slept late so they couldn't get a ship, but tomorrow for sure and so forth. I was getting disgusted and could see this thing running on for weeks. We started off for dinner. In the hall I ran into Agnes. She had spent the day interviewing people down at the house of detention and found out for sure that Hugh was really there. Next day she planned to get a lawyer for him so he could get out on bail. She had quit her job so as to give all her time to the matter. I gave her the number of a lawyer I knew who got a friend of mine off with two months after he had been caught inside an office building at 4 a.m. with $1,500 in his pocket that didn't belong to him. I asked Agnes if she would join us for dinner, but she said no, she was broke. I said, on me, and she still said no. She was always like that, so I said good night and walked out. The others were standing in the street in front of the house. I said, Agnes wouldn't come for dinner because she's broke. Some people have some pride. Philip said, people get silly ideas. <laughs> yeah, I said, but you're an artist. You don't believe in decency and honesty and gratitude. Where shall we eat? Philip said he wanted to go to the Fifth Avenue Playhouse and see Pepe de Moco after dinner, so we decided to eat in the village. We took the Seventh Avenue subway down to Sheridan Square and went into Chumley's to eat. Philip started right off ordering Pernod and daiquiris. After dinner, we walked to the Fifth Avenue Playhouse. Philip and Rico got in for half price when they showed their merchant marine papers. When we were in the theater, Philip went in the first row and sat down. Rico went in the next, then me, then Al last. During the movie, Al kept craning his neck to look across at Philip, and finally moved to the other side of the front row next, where he had an unobstructed view of Philip's profile. After the movie, we went to McDonald's Tavern, which is a queer place, and it was packed with fags all screaming and swishing around. Every now and then, one of them would utter a shrill cry. We pushed our way to the bar and ordered some drinks. The older fags were looking frankly at Philip, but the younger ones pretended not to notice him and stood around in groups, talking and looking at him out of the corner of their eyes. <laughs> there were several sailors standing around, and I heard one of them say, Where are the women in this fucking town? A well-dressed, middle-aged man started talking to Philip about James Joyce and told Philip he didn't know anything about literature, trying to establish himself in a position of dominance. Then he bought Philip a drink. A little, thin, black-haired man with a slightly insane grin on his face came up to Al and asked him for a cigarette. Al produced the package, and there was only one cigarette in it. The man said, The last cigarette. Well, I'll take it. Which he did. Al looked at him coldly and turned his head away. The man began to explain that in the village he had to act like a character. He was from Hartford, Connecticut, and looking for a woman. Then he caught sight of two lesbians who were standing by the piano, and his eyes glistened. Women, he said. He went over and stood behind them, looking at them with his insane grin. We left McDonald's and went around the corner to Minetta's. Philip said, I wonder what Babs and Jenny are doing tonight. And Rico said, Well, we'll see them later. The usual assortment of stupid characters was assembled in Minetta's. Joe Gould was at a table. A man bumped into Al and said he was sorry. Al said, that's quite all right. The man said, I apologize because I'm a gentleman, but you wouldn't know anything about that. Al looked at him and the man said, it so happens that I was an intercollegiate boxing champion at the University of Michigan. Nobody said anything, and after a while, the champion wandered away to bother somebody else. People in bars are always claiming to be boxers, hoping thereby to ward off attack, like a black snake will vibrate its tail and leaves to try to impersonate a rattlesnake. Everyone had a few drinks. Al sat down with a fairly good-looking girl and began to talk to her. Philip was standing at the bar, and I saw him showing his seaman's papers to someone who was trying to show him a document proving something about what he did in the last war. I sat down with Al and the girl. It was hard work talking to her. Al was telling her about the movie, and I mentioned that I had been to Algiers. At this, the girl looked at me with great hostility and demanded, When were you in Algiers? I said, In 1934. She continued to look at me with an expression of stupid suspicion and anger. I began to get a feeling familiar to me from my bartending days of being the only sane man in a nut house. It doesn't make you feel superior, but depressed and scared, because there is nobody you can contact. Right then, I decided to go home. 
I said, well, Al, I have to get up early tomorrow. I think I'll go along. So I got up and left and started to walk home. As I was walking past Tony Pastors, I saw Pat, the lesbian bouncer, throw a drunken young sailor out into the street. The sailor said, that place is full of fucking queers. He swung at the air and nearly fell on his face. Then he staggered away, muttering to himself. I walked over to 7th Avenue, then up to Christopher Street to buy the morning papers. On my way back, I saw there was an argument in front of George's, so I crossed over to see what was going on. The proprietor was standing in the doorway, arguing with three people who he had just thrown out of the joint. One of the men kept saying, I write stories for the Saturday Evening Post. The proprietor said, I don't care what you do, Jack. I don't want you in my place. Now beat it. And he advanced on the group. They shrank away, but when the proprietor turned to go back in, the man who wrote for the Saturday Evening Post came forward again and the whole process was repeated. As I walked away, the proprietor was saying, Why don't you go somewhere else? There are plenty of other places in New York. I had the feeling that all over America such stupid arguments were taking place on street corners and in bars and restaurants. All over America, people were pulling credentials out of their pockets and sticking them under someone else's nose to prove they'd been somewhere or done something. And I thought someday everyone in America will suddenly jump up and say, I don't take any shit, and start pushing and cursing and clawing at the man next to him.